Good morning, Lori. Hi, Amber. Hello. So this is Lori Dossie. She is one of our diabetes educators here at Freeman, and we are going to interview Lori because she has a really amazing story of a tragic event that she went through as a nurse about 12 years into her nursing career, and it was several years ago. So mm -hmm. let's start off by talking about how long you've been a nurse, because it's been quite a little while. Yeah, it was 1983 when I graduated okay. from my first RN program. I later went back to school and got a bachelor's degree, but I graduated from NEO in Miami in 1983 wow. and um, ended up seeking out employment within Oklahoma and, and landed in Oklahoma City. Okay, so in Oklahoma City um, in 1995, uh, actually on April 19th, 1995, um, you went through probably one of the most trying and um, difficult probably experiences in your nursing career Absolutely. so why don't you tell us a little bit about Absolutely. what happened that day it was just it, it, if you realize we just went through an anniversary of this a week ago so you can imagine it was this time of year it was mm -hmm. a beautiful morning and I was the assistant director of the emergency room at Children's Hospital and Children's Hospital was part of a big um, university hospital campuses that were downtown in Oklahoma City and they're actually about a mile and a half away from downtown and it was around nine o'clock in the morning and several of us had stepped out onto the patio of the driveway of the emergency room similar to what we would have now where the ambulances come in and we're looking at what a beautiful day it was and we were looking at the sky and as we were walking back in the exterior double doors of the emergency room we heard this incredible loud boom just immediately followed by another boom and I can recall that we all just kind of looked at each other with one of those well what in the world was that and we walked through the doors through the double doors into the emergency room past triage and in that probably 20 seconds that it took us to walk in there, our entire phone bank just lit up in the emergency room and the phones started ringing. And the next thing we knew, we heard um, through these phone calls, it was the police and several other um, physicians from the adult side of our hospital saying there's been an explosion downtown mm. and they think that there are um, a lot of casualties and prepare for mass casualties and activate your disaster plan. Well, we had done that so many times over the years and, and we would always laugh because you had to put on the orange vest like you were a crossing guard. And <laughs> each one of them would say like nurse or coordinator or triage or physician. So here we were with these vests on and indeed we were told that it was the Murrah Building, which we all as Oklahoma City residents knew as the Social Security Office because okay. that was on the first floor. So it was at the Murrah building and someone said there's a daycare there mm -hmm. and um, you guys need to prepare for all of the children if, if they are any that they can get out. So in retrospect, when we all looked back at it as a group, because we went through so many de debriefings with FEMA and different agencies, that there was a 12-minute lapse of time there until our first arrival. And in that 12 minutes, those minutes stand out so much to me because any, anybody who's worked in critical care knows that there's a sense of excitement and adrenaline and a rush and um, we of course didn't have televisions in there. It right. wasn't like now where you had more televisions in areas and so the phones, our own relatives were trying to call into the emergency room to say are you guys okay? Uh, are you get, sure. It's getting ready to happen and what's happening and do you know more? Well we didn't know anything yet and so I was in charge that day and I had walked out to the driveway and we decided we were going to wait on our first ambulance and it backed up the emergency room driveway which was somewhat sloped and you're very accustomed to that door opening and and then and then paramedic would come around and out would come a stretcher and when that door opened I remember it was the first moment I was struck with such shock because instead of there being a stretcher 
it was all people seated with people on their laps. There had to have been at least 20 people oh, in the wow. back of that ambulance. All of them awake and alert, but with just covered in blood. Their mm -hmm. clothing was covered in blood. And on top of that was just this gray light ash mm -hmm. all over everyone. And as you began to try to, it just looked like Night of the Living Dead. It looked like a mm -hmm. horror movie where they were just all covered in blood. And as you began talking to them, you realized they couldn't hear. Nobody could hear. And that was something oh. that we didn't realize right. that the, being near the blast had taken everyone's hearing temporarily. Mm -hmm. And many of the children that were there have had permanent damage mm -hmm. and have been part of a lot of studying throughout the years but they were all with the same voice just saying help help and these were all adults mm -hmm. and we kept thinking where are the children where are the children we did end up getting another wave of children very shortly thereafter but unfortunately we were told that too many of the children were not able to be brought to the hospital mm -hmm. because they were already um, deceased at the scene and um, that victims were being taken to all the hospitals in Oklahoma City and there was no way to account for who you had especially when you have younger people and children you don't have any way of identifying them you don't right. know and as each and every one of our rooms just filled up and stretchers within just the ER by the desk with we just had people everywhere everybody needed an IV and as you would wipe off I can I can so remember taking alcohol swab and wiping those little hands I was holding getting ready to do what I'd done a million times before and as soon as you would get ready to insert the IV it was covered in ash again and you had just wiped it and I can remember just wiping over mm. and over and my eyes being full of tears thinking why is this like this and then I thought quit just wiping and just put it in and everybody just was so the ER was so full of people I'd never seen before and it was loud and it was busy but I can remember looking at all my co-workers all of the nurses that I had worked with for so long and I had never ever seen them so at the top of their game mm -hmm. I had never felt such a sense of purpose mm -hmm. at that moment and I remember thinking my whole desire to be a nurse was to try to get people to not be a, in fear just like we hate our children in fear and our friends in fear and our family in fear it was one of the motivators for me in nursing was that people are so vulnerable that you're there to to let them know you're here just for them and I realized that day that I wasn't just there for them in a clinical way mm -hmm. that at that point we were everything for them mm -hmm. and the ER just became more and more packed and a couple of hours had gone by and I heard some of the x-ray techs which were part of our big department as x-ray was in our department say oh it's the anniversary of Waco and I remember thinking people will just say anything now they're drawing a conclusion about Waco mm -hmm. and down in the um, radiology hallway of our emergency room was a little TV for patients in the waiting room and it was playing and I saw everyone around it and they were indeed making this whole thing coincide with Waco which we later found out that and another event had been the motivating factors mm -hmm. in it but never did we ever believe that there was a terrorist or such an act of violence. We still kept thinking it was a natural disaster, like somehow the whole gas lines in right. the building blew up or something that was not a man-made accident. We don't want to believe that anyone would purposefully hurt children, for one, or anyone. Or anyone. I and mean, so it was so far from my belief. Mm -hmm. and. As we worked and worked and worked, I saw people like secretaries to the intensivist and people you worked with all the time handing us rolls of bandage or IV things or more towels and more gowns and more this. And everybody just became 
like they were all there for the same purpose, mm -hmm. whether they were a housekeeper, a secretary, a clerical worker, a radiologist, a nurse. It did not matter your title that day. Mm -hmm. We were all one and we were all there. And at one point we decided we were labeling everyone with a number. And at one point we went out to the admitting area, which was outside of the emergency room proper, similar to here to see how many numbers we had assigned and as soon as I opened the doors just to enter out to that area I had no idea that our emergency room had completely the waiting room had completely filled up with parents and media and I couldn't even push the doors all the way open and standing out there were just it felt like hundreds of people with holding pictures they were as big as eight by ten pictures of their children saying do you have my baby back there is my child back there um, and microphones being stuck in your face by local media national media I remember thinking how did they get here so fast mm -hmm. in what I felt had only been a few minutes had probably been four hours right. and they kept thinking they were going to go back in the building and then you know within the hour the building had to be evacuated again for a second threat and it we all felt so much we could have gotten so much more accomplished had that had they not had to evacuate the daycare area mm -hmm. but the feeling when I walked into that waiting room and saw all of those people I thought none of my technical clinical expertise matters to these people right now what matters to them is that they're they're just their trust in me and they they will do anything for me to say that their baby's there and okay and i had an overwhelming desire to want to tell every one of them that their baby was there and okay but we didn't know mm -hmm. and all we could do was encourage people not to leave don't leave because they were going from hospital to hospital to hospital and then we couldn't keep track of them right. and couldn't keep track of who was where and how many victims were where because some people would just take some of the walking wounded and leave and go to another facility that they heard maybe wasn't as busy or that they're taking people here or there and I really thought then God you just showed me a whole nother side of nursing that I'm so honored to be a part of and it really, really, really shaped me from then on in terms of why we are nurses and how our, just how our reason for being a nurse is reinforced and changed all the time. Mm -hmm. I have patients now who so many nurses think are the most difficult of the difficult to take care of because they so often don't take care of their chronic disease in which I deal with now but I have to go back to that fear and trying to take away fear and even if it's only one out of every 100 of my patients who said you're the first one who's ever explained it to me like this and I can do this I have found that there is a reward in every niche of nursing Absolutely. no matter what it is from birth to death and everything in between and that more than just my patient matters mm -hmm. all of those people who clutch pictures of patients who look for patients every one of them we were all everything to them just mm -hmm. as much as we were to our patients that day mm -hmm. and it will I will forever uh, let that continue to mold me as a nurse just the dependence that that people place the trust that they place in you as a nurse and what an honor it is that they give that to us at their most vulnerable moments absolutely so looking back you said um, that you remember practicing those disaster plans and kind mm -hmm. of, you know, oh, we look silly in our oh, little vests and, and things like that. And but joke and so obviously, those plans and practices are very important. So if you were to give advice to anyone that uh, works in an emergency department mm -hmm. or just any hospital that has a disaster plan, what would that advice be in preparation for potentially going through something like that? those are so important even though we have so much fun with them and 
if you participate in some of the more sophisticated ones where you're really taken by surprise, we had a few. We had one that year before where it was an airplane accident at the airport and they didn't tell us and all of them were in moulage and they looked completely real mm. and wow. of course as we later found out because they had signs on their chests as mm -hmm. to their injuries the more that we got together and even enjoyed and laughed we were still practicing our skills sure. and that flowed over and what I remember thinking briefly that day was wow this real thing goes so much better than mm -hmm. it did in all the practice but yet, just that feeling of, of unity that we had as a group, mm -hmm. even though it was a different kind of unity, we were still laughing, smiling at each other as we said, hey, let me help you. you the back of this gown is undone and you would still find that sense of unity and you almost would look at him and think remember when we did this before and now this is the real thing yeah. and still feeling that just that sense of pride there mm -hmm. was a real sense of pride of unity and if there was I remember if there was one single person you worked with who maybe wasn't your pa favorite person to work with that day you still looked at them with different eyes mm -hmm. and we forever afterwards became a department that we never ever had a problem with lack of respect for each other mm -hmm. and it was like then we all became part of a club a part of a survivors club almost mm -hmm. of what we had shared together and it really made us more cohesive as Absolutely. a group do you guys still talk with one another? Are you still yes. in touch with each other? Yes, several of us are, and we've kept track of our careers. Um, a few are still there, mm -hmm. still there, and have have recently retired because I realized I was a lot younger then, and I was working with a lot of people my own age, and so it it was almost sad when I found out some of them had retired, mm -hmm. and um, some of them contacted me after the Joplin tornado. Mm -hmm and said what are the odds that you've been through this twice but i will tell you that i did not go through the same thing in the joplin tornado because i wasn't on duty mm -hmm. but yet i felt like i understood so much to each and every person who was on duty that mm -hmm. night and i remember thinking you're going to be needed the most in the morning and calling colleen and saying do you want me to come now and she said, wait until in the morning. And I remember thinking, everybody else doesn't know that this isn't over tonight right. or tomorrow. This is just like a stage of grief. Mm -hmm. We've got a long road ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And I think we're still dealing with exactly, that. Exactly, exactly. You know. And so by living through what I went through, neither of which are more horrendous than the other whatsoever it, it's it's very close to the same number of victims mm -hmm. even and they were local people too i worked with people who had family members in that building right. we all worked and knew people who were in those homes and mm -hmm. those businesses and so it it did make me feel like I could, my friends who were involved with it directly that night. In fact, the very next morning I got a call from a nurse who used to work on medical, who now works in TCU, who said, you're the only person I want to talk to because you're the only person who knows. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it did give me that sense that once again I could be relied on Absolutely. in a different way mm -hmm. in a disaster. And so, okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story. You're it's an so amazing welcome. One. You're very welcome. Okay.